have to say as well, like a, a lot of people I think are saying like, how is it that I'm suddenly playing so much better than, than in the past against Magnus? And I mean, certainly Magnus was, was probably not at his best throughout. Um, but I did feel very strong that sort of the support of the fans, the fact that it wasn't solely me playing against Magnus made a big difference um, in that sense. And sort of like, you know, when, when, when things go badly, um, you kind of, you feel really bad. But I think when you have like a lot of fans out there who are rooting for you, it's much easier to pick yourself up and keep going forward and keep trying. And, um, and so for me, I felt like, especially today, maybe not even today, but all the last, last couple of days, um, towards, towards, towards the end of the match, like I kept trying to get chances. And I, I really was very proud of that because again, as I said before, many times when I've played against Magnus, I've fallen apart. Whether you want to call it nerves, choking, whatever you want to call it, um, I have a tendency to sort of collapse. And, and the way that I kept it together today after losing the first game, drawing the second game, then sort of going all in in the third game, um, I just, I thought I thought I played played very well. And I'm, I'm very happy with my performance. So we are going to take a look at the games from today. So today was the final day um, in the Magnus Carlsen uh, Invitational Tour. So... So no, no, no red vest, no watch. You guys want, want me to put my watch on and, and flex the watch? Um, I'm not going to flex the watch right now. Any coaching today? No, I mean, the, the, you know, one thing that I really wish um, is I really wish that I had had the chance to um, do some coaching. But the stupid event, like, the stupid event just had to go seven days. And so I had no chance to really give coaching to anybody. Um, uh, so what to do? All right. So E4, yeah, stupid. No, I just mean, like, it's kind of weird to say this, but, like, I, I'm i legitimately upset that the, that it went all seven days because I really I really wanted to do some lessons. Like, I wanted to give a lesson to Scissors. I wanted to help Forreston. And then this, this event just, uh, it had to go all seven days. So, like, I, I wasn't able to give a lesson to Scissors, wasn't able to give a lesson to Forreston. And, man, now, like, there's, there's no time. However, you guys, on that note, I will probably be giving lessons to um, to Zexro. Probably he's he is a late last minute replacement for I will dominate. Um, so I will probably give a lesson or two to Zexro in advance of, of his upcoming matches. Um, okay, so e4, e5. I play knight f3, knight six, bishop b5. So now that the match is over, um, I'm going to give you guys some other insights. So one thing that I will say is. I wouldn't necessarily say that my strategy was optimal overall um, against Magnus with the white pieces, but much like Magnus played the Nightorf in the, in in his um, in his first match against me the first day, I decided that what I was going to do with these tournaments, um, and maybe in this match it, it worked out well enough, but specifically in the match against Ding Loren, um, which I lost, I also kept playing this going into these Berlin openings, and one of the reasons that I that I did this is because. Again, I felt that it made a lot of sense to try and get some more experience. I don't generally play um, a lot of anti-Berlins from the white side. I don't have many games um, many games over the board. So I thought I would use these matches to get some experience. So that's, that's also a large part of why every day I played into it and I did not actually s switch around and move, move to other stuff was because I figured... If I'm gonna if I'm gonna play this and maybe then play it later over the board, I really figure who else to play it against and get the best experience than um than Magnus. There's literally no one else that I would that I would do it against. Don't let Zexor do interviews. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So so that was a large part because I know there are people who are gonna ask me. Um, there are a large part of people who are gonna be like like, dude, why'd you keep going to Berlin every day? Oh my God, why'd you keep doing this? And um. The large, 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 like the long and short of it is that it wasn't so much about like the match specifically. It's more that I wanted to just um, get as much experience in these various positions as much as I could. Why didn't I flag at the end? I could not have flagged Magnus in the final position. We will talk about the last game later on. Um, but but let's let's keep going with this. So knight f6. I play d3. Bishop c5. So Magnus decides to go back to this. Um, the previous couple of days, he had been playing pawn to d6, but he played bishop c5 here. Thank you, Puritan, for the 400 bits. Thank you, Led Zeppelin, for the $69. Uh, Starcraft for the Prime as well. Thank you so much. Appreciate you guys. Um, I'm already picking up the Valley Girl vibe. What do you mean, Valley Girl vibe? What do you mean? Am I? Really? Am I already starting to sound like I'm in L.A.? That's that's not that's no good. That's, that's not good. Um, okay, so I take. I play knight bd2. I hope you guys are joking, right? No, I think you guys are joking. I hope you're joking. Okay, so takes. Um, uh, I play. <laughs> I play knight bd2. Castles. I go. Uh, I, I I go. I go pawn to h3 here again. Previous match, I played queen e2. I also played knight c4 earlier. Um, but I played h3. 
Magnus plays knight d7. This is very similar to um, to what we played before. Um, knight c4 here and um, a5. So now I go bishop e3. He goes pawn to f6. Um, geez. Now, now I'm going to have to watch my intonation and everything. You guys have me all scared. Um, every person in LA will tell you the valley is not LA. Yeah, I know the valley is not LA, but like whatever, dude. Um, okay, so, so I go bishop e3. Magnus plays f6, and now I decide to castle. He plays b5. We trade, or I go knight d2. Um, and now bishop e3, fe3. Now this is a very conceptual position, and the pawns are doubled here, but white does, because the kings are sort of castle on the same side, uh, white can try to play knight h4, knight f5, and bring the knights in. And to give you some context about why it's so important to study and understand differences in your games, is because now I will give you um, an example. Sorry, I'm going to have to go to another, another window again. Um, uh, one second, where was that? Um, where was that played? One second. I'm just pulling up another game um, so that you guys have some idea of what I'm talking about. So let's pull this game up. Again, this is not on chess.com. This is from, um, oh, this is, this is from, uh, this is, okay, whatever, I got it. This is from, um, from this Hamburg FIDE Grand Prix played last year. So you'll notice, you guys, same opening. I'm sorry that I cover part of the board, but it doesn't really matter. Um, same opening, you see, but I played h3 this game, knight d7, here, bishop e3. So you, one thing that's very important is you'll see that this is the same kind of setup. Uh, I have these double pawns. But the difference is that in this game, as you'll see, um, what happened was that, that uh, Veselin Toplov was able to swing the other way and castle to the queen side. So because he was able to cast to this side, having the, um, oh, are we doing a poll? Ha having this open king on the king side of these open lines was actually not good. Because black castled to the other side. Um, so so this this is just worth noting why, where you have to know understand what the differences are in all these positions. So when we get back to this game now, you'll see the differences here. It's the same set of pawn structure. But Black's king is on the same side as my king. His king did not go the other way. Um, is he car a valley grill? Uh oh. Um, like totally, dude. Totally. Like totally. Like whatever. Or like whatever. Um, okay. All right. Um, so back to the chess. Um, so F takes E3. A4 is played here. Uh, I <laughs> go knight H4. Um, idea to sort of bring my knights into f5 and h4 again. Magnus goes c5. I play knight f5. As Gary Kasparov has said many times, when you put a knight on f5, it's worth at least a pawn. LA has changed you, man. I haven't even really been out. Like, I was thinking that maybe later today I'll go down to the pier for sunset. Um, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll go over to, 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 the, to Santa Monica Pier later and just catch the sunset at some point. Um, if, 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 if I'm not streaming until like 8 p.m., but we'll see. Um, so I play queen e2, bishop e6, I go knight f3, queen d7, knight h4, again double, doubling these knights, they support each other very nicely. Plays rook a d8, I go rook fd1, and at this point I was very unhappy with my position because again, I really want to try to attack on the king's side, but the problem is black is going to smash the center with c4 and infiltrate with the queen and the rook. So I go rook d1, he goes king h8, I play d4, I was very happy to find this, because now after we trade everything and Magnus goes queen c6, uh, at this point, this is where I felt that I really blew the chances to win this match early. Because at this point, Magnus was down to maybe three and a half minutes. And I had like seven minutes. And I was really starting to press him on the clock. And he was a little bit nervous. And so I played rook d1. And he played queen c5. And here I just blundered. Um, basically, one thing that happened a lot yesterday, and kind of it happened to me at least in this game specifically to start off today, is I sort of had these moments where you can call it nerves. You can call it whatever you want to. But I had one idea, and then I ended up flipping to some other idea. And when I flipped from the original idea, the original intuition, into playing the other idea, it just was a terrible decision. Um, so specifically, when I talk about yesterday, there was a point in the final game when I played knight d2, and I meant to go knight h2, and I just I played knight d2 instantly when I meant to put the knight the other way. And then in this game, when Magnus played queen c5, I instantly thought, well, I can just go b4, ab3, ab3, and it's equal. Nothing's wrong. Um, Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so I saw b4, and then I'm like, then I was like, oh, well, no, but I can just go queen f2, and, and I keep all the play alive, and there's probably some trick with my knights, or something is jumping. Um, when, in fact, nothing is jumping, because after queen f2, rook d4, uh, I play knight takes d4, Magnus correctly takes a pawn on a2, and now I'm just down a pawn, and in really bad shape here. Um, 
Not a whole lot I can do because basically black can just retreat with the bishop and bring the rook to the center of the board. And b4, a3 is a huge threat to create a pass pawn on the queen side. So, I mean, very, very careless. Uh, basically, as soon as I play queen a2, I'm like, wait, can't he just trade and take a2? And of course, Magnus correctly saw that he could take a2. And now black is just simply better. I do not have 96 with the fork because black trades the queens. And one thing that players who are weaker tend to have a lot of issue with is seeing these backwards diagonals. So bishops can also move backwards, not just forward. And um, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue. So, all right. So here I played b3. Again, trying to go full on Bobby Fischer. Um, uh, um, so trying to go full Bobby Fischer here, basically, and trap the bishop on, or not go full Bobby Fischer, go full Boris Baski and trap the bishop on a2. But it doesn't quite work because after rook d8, I play knight f5, he just takes, and now he just gobbles. I can't take the bishop because if I take the bishop, I lose my rook on d1. So knight is pinned by the rook. Um, so this is uh, this is just gg pretty much at this point. And here I played this insane move, knight g7. And um, I think there are many ways for black to win here. I think rook d4 was one of the ways. I don't think it was actually the best way necessarily. I thought bishop d1, um, knight e6, and queen e7 was just game over on the spot. Uh, and um, and yeah, like I basically he takes on d4, which is good enough because I, I don't have rook d7 check here because knight takes d7, captures the rook. If I check with the queen, the king, as I do in the game, I can't capture the bishop because then I lose my rook. So at this point, it's just quite simply resignable. I decided because Magnus was low on time, I might as well just play play a couple of moves. Um, so I go queen e3, hoping again to get a fossil with rook d8 and win the queen because I would hit the king. But he correctly goes knight d7, just cuts off this idea. Now I can't move the rook. I still can't take the bishop because I lose the rook. Now all checks are kind of ineffective. So um, I played king h1. What was I thinking about when I played knight g7? I was just like, you know, I'm just losing. What, what am I doing? Why did I do this? Why did I just go b4? Um, so king e8, I go queen d2, bishop e6. Um, I play rook e5, queen e5, rook h4, knight f8. And now black is uh, just completely winning. King is very safe here. The knight and bishop guard each other, and black just has two pawns running all the way up the board. So uh, it's just pretty, pretty routine here. Not much really to be said. I'll just show the rest of the game. Uh, c5, queen b1, queen d5, rook f4, b4, queen a1, knight d7, just guards the pawn, and now the pawns are free to roam. Uh, I go queen b1, he goes king g7, queen e1, and now b3, queen g3, queen g5, and here I resign in lieu of the fact that I can't really stop this pawn from queening. Um, if I trade, he just has two pawns, so there's just nothing to be done. Um, and so I resigned here, and with that, Magnus took a 1-0 one, one lead. Um, and we will move on to the second game in a second, but I guess I'm going to go to Twitter first. Apparently I need to click some of these links. What are these links? Let's hope these are good links, or are these bad links? Let's see. Okay. What are these tweets? Okay, Sauron is still good. Oh yeah, this was this tweet that he did right away or something, right? I mean, this... Silly, silly. Um, yeah. Well, uh, you know, there, there's a good saying that I have, um, which honestly, I, I, what, I, what I would say in, in regards um, in regards to these sorts of things is, uh, regardless of the outcome, um, regardless of the outcome, you really, you know, if I had won the match, I would not sort of be making these snarky sort of tweets. I would just be, you know, I would just say, okay, I won the event. Whereas I feel like Magnus, he always has this need to try and put everyone down when something goes his way. So um, it's it's disappointing. Very disappointing. Um, all right. So let's keep going. What's this other tweet? It's another tweet. What is this? It's another Magnus tweet. It's not right, but it's not wrong either. What is this? Okay. I mean, again... Yeah, I, I don't really understand this. Kind of kind of weird. Very, very strange. Um, yeah, very, very strange. All right. Um, okay, and what is the last one? We have this one. This is another one. <clears throat> okay, so there's this last one. What is the great player, tremendous competitor? I think a couple of you copy and paste this into the chat. Um... Yeah, well, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. As you guys know, the, the Twitters are not completely run by the players themselves. And I I have, this is, I literally have not seen any other tweet by Magnus that looks as nice as this. 
So I, I don't actually think Magnus tweeted this. I think this was his PR team that tweeted this comment, and I have no issue with saying that because I, I feel pretty confident in saying that. Um, I, I don't think Magnus tweeted this. I, I've literally have not seen a tweet like this um, towards Anish, towards anybody that has been like this, so I don't think he tweeted it. I think this was his PR team 100%. Um, all right, so let's get back to the, uh, let's get back to the, the analysis. Um, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Um, so we'll move on to the second game, which I played with the black pieces. Now, one thing that um, uh, one thing that I would say very specifically that I was very happy with in general with this match is that even in the second game, I decided to um, I decided to, uh, to to go for it. I did not play e5. Um, so the idea was here that uh, I, I thought I could play e5, but the problem was if I play e5, knight f3, knight c6, and I go back into the Berlin. Magnus is probably going to make a uh, he's probably going to make a draw again, and the problem is in the, at this situation when you're thinking about this statistically speaking, um, where it's the final where it's the final set of games, it's more important no, kind of to, to take shots. chances as opposed to going for broke because at this point I felt the odds of losing this game to Magnus if I lose that's life if I lose then so be it, um, but at the same time. If uh, if I don't take the chance here, it's one less game. So I thought the odds of playing for the trying to keep the game messy with black, with the less games remaining, was more important. Um, so e4, I play c5, knight f3, I play knight c6. Um, he goes he goes bishop b5, I play g6 here. Uh, yeah, but Chad, I, I could give you the same thing. There there was a period of time a couple couple years back when I um. When I won a couple of tournaments in a row, I won the Gibraltar tournament. I won, um, I won the Zurich Chess Challenge, and I think I won the U.S. Championship. And when I won those tournaments in a row, Magnus' tweet was, congrats on winning a bunch of Mickey Mouse tournaments. So he basically insulted me, and he insulted the tournaments that I had won in a row. So when you guys say this stuff about being friendly, um, I'm, just, I'm just telling you that it's, I've literally never seen a tweet like that before. Um, so I played G6, Magnus Castles. I played Bishop G7 here. Uh, he plays c3, I go knight f6, and now he plays rook e1, I castle, he plays d4. So now we trade the pawns, I go pawn to d5, e5, knight e4. And at this point, the position is pretty balanced, I would say, objectively. Um, I mean, considering that in this point I wanted to keep the game going rather than making a draw, um, I thought it was, it was more important to get out of the opening with a position that's playable. And I was very, I was very happy to get to this point because not the blacks even... Not that Black's even doing very well, but the game goes on. Oh, jeez. Hit the wrong button again. So I played bishop d7. He goes bishop a4, which I think was an excellent move by Magnus. Um, because at this point, I actually thought I might be playing for more. I thought I, might, I thought I might be better in this game if he played like bishop f1. And I get some rook c8, some queen b6, and knight a5. And I, I really was feeling good. And then Magnus found this bishop a4 move, which was just very annoying. Because after bishop a4... I don't know what my next move is here. I actually like I, I I was very surprised. I tried to play knight a5 and confuse it. Um but I think bishop a4 was just an excellent move. I, I thought it was an extremely good move by Magnus here because I was getting very optimistic here. Um so bishop a4, I play knight a5, we trade, goes knight up d2. So I trade the knights, I go knight c4 again, trying to mess it up, but I don't know. I mean, it doesn't look like uh, doesn't look like the best try. Then again, I just I, I don't think there's anything here. I don't think there's anything here. Um. Uh. Yeah, I I, I mean I, I don't think there's anything here for black. I wanted to go knight c4 and confuse matters, and it's very similar because when we trade here, it's similar to those b5 games I played before, where you end up with these pawns on the opposite sort of diagonals here. So um, for that reason, uh, I kind of was hoping that I would make this messy. But the problem is after Magnus plays a4, queen d5, queen f3, the whole thing just goes poof, and um, there are no winning chances. I know the computer thinks black is okay, but the game. But you know what's amazing here is the computer says black is better, but as it picks up depth, it's going to show that Magnus was right here, and this is not actually better for black, which is um, which is going to be. I think it is. Let me see. Or is it really saying black is better? I don't think so. Yeah, it's going to come down. I, I guarantee you, you're going to see that Magnus, his intuition here was right, and that this is not actually a correct evaluation. That black is a uh, black is doing um, black is not even better here. 
Now, originally, I thought that black was better. How do I know this? Because of the progression of the game. That's that's how I know it. Um, so, so here I play. Here I play. Queen takes queen. Pawn takes. And now I went e6. I guess I can go rook c8. Uh, Magnus. One thing that he correctly understood here as well is that the bishop on g7 is stuck behind the pawn wall. So even though the bishop, even though he's got these double pawns, queens are off the board. And with queens off the board at this point. Um, even though even though he's got these doubled pawns, they're very active and they, they create this kind of mini house here on e5, f4, and d4. And um, and I don't I don't think black is better here. I, I really don't think so. So I played e6, rook c1, rook c8, rook c3. Now I think you guys are going to see the valuation is going to go down even further. As I said before, you see, yeah. As I said before, um, Magnus correctly understood that this whole end game leads to something that is uh, uh, very 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 dry. So here I go rook to c6. Um, seriously, guys, relax, relax. We, we we don't we don't need we don't need any of this stuff right now. So b3, I go rook c8. We trade. He goes rook b3, and now it's amazing that even the computer at low depth really just doesn't understand. Now now it understands that white is actually better. Um, so so at this point, what white is white is probably slightly better objectively. It should be a draw, um, but I think that that at this point it's uh it's not. There isn't really much going on. I, I was very, I was very unhappy um, as well because I really wanted a game, and then I realized somewhere around this point, it's like you know, it's going to be some end game where I probably can draw it, but but I'm going to be slightly worse, and there are going to be no winning chances, so it's just bleh, kind of. So I played rook c7, rook b1, b6, a5. Correct move. White tries to break the pawn structure here, and when I take, he goes rook a3, and now not only is going to win the pawn back, but the pawn on a7 is also going to be weak here. So I go f6, f rook a5, g5. Important, by the way, here that I try to break the pawns because the one thing white would like to do is get a this mini house here with f4, e5, d4. So when I'm able to play it like this, if he ever takes here, you'll see the pawns are now split and separated. It's an easy draw. And white cannot go f4 and build the, build the chain, of, chain of pawns the way he wants to um, because I will always just trade and then trade on e5 twice. So I was very happy to find um, g5 here. He goes king g2, I play h6, just support the pawn, so if he ever takes, I just take back. Um, I don't know if this was actually the correct move when I think about it in retrospect. Um, but he, but he, because he plays h4, now after rook d7, rook a6, rook e8, by the way, if I go king f7, I blunder d5 here. Um, and maybe, no, it, it actually is just bad. It, it is spiking. So I, I correctly assess that this was not... That this was not the right way to play. Um, so I played rook e8 to guard the pawn. He goes rook b5. Now I bring the king, and now Magnus plays h5. And at this point, it's um, it's it's definitely a draw. But the problem is long term. My pawns are all on dark squares versus these pawns being on light squares. So when Ma when Magnus played h5, um, I realized that it was uh, that there was real danger in the position for me here. Um, so so that's why I play rook e7. He goes king g3. And now I have to trade and just force an end game. If I don't force an end game here, it's going to get really, really dicey. Like he's going to go f4, rook a4, rook a5, and maybe it's still a draw. But my bishop is really ugly here on g7. It's stuck behind the pawn walls, and I really should try and do something active to open up the position. So now we trade. I go rook d5. We trade here. He uh, he goes king g4. I play uh, rook takes e5. Rook a7, rook e7, we trade. He goes king f5, king f7, uh, pawn f4, we trade. Unfortunately, at this point, like I knew the position was bad because I have this weakness forever, but I had, but I was almost certain that even if I lose this d pawn, it has to be a draw. And so I play d4, bishop d2, d3. I just gambit the pawn, um, and I just kind of waited here, made some random moves. Of course, white cannot check, by the way. Probably people thought I blundered here, but if check, I go king f4. Uh, bishop g7, king f3, and no matter what he does, I just go here and capture. So when he takes, I go king g4 and capture the pawn, and it will be king and bishop against king, which will lead to a draw. So here he goes king c5, and finally at this point, what I did was I was like, okay, en enough fooling around. I I'm almost certain that if I put the king on f7, it has to be a draw. So I retreated with the king here. This way there are no ideas with the white king skirting around the back and getting behind my king. Because if he can somehow skirt his king and get behind here, there are a lot of dangerous ideas where white might be winning. So I finally realized it's like, okay, no, no fooling around. This must be a draw um, with the king on f7. So he goes here. I go back. He goes here. And now I just kind of just, just wait with my bishop forever. 
Finally, it goes to f5. I just keep waiting. I keep waiting. I keep waiting. I keep waiting. Um, and I just check and I go back. And at this point, it's a draw. After bishop d4, um, it's worth noting, you guys, by the way, that this endgame is actually losing. Like, you would think objectively it's a draw. But the reason king and pawn endgames are really, really brutally hard is because there is what we call triangulation. So after king e5, king f7, king e5, uh, king e7, you're, you're like, okay, so if f6, um, I go king f8, king e6, king e8, and I have opposition. f7, king f8, king f6, and it's a draw. But the problem is in this position, this is a well-known line where there is what we call triangulation. So the reason that this is winning is white can use the triangulation method to get the king on the wrong square here, where he goes king e4. Uh, if I go king f7, he goes king f5, and then the king runs to g6 and captures, of course. And um, and so I have to go king e8, but now he triangulates again because he goes f4. So I still can't go to f7 because he goes f5, g6. And when I go to f8 to try to keep the opposition, now he plays king e5, and this is losing. Because if I go up, of course he goes over and over, and when I go over, he goes king e6, king f8, f7, and now he's winning because the king comes up and he makes a queen. So this is uh, this is just um, this is just classic triangulation, king and pawn endgames. This is of course in Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual. Um, so anybody who has not read it should of course read the manual if they want to understand this endgame. So I, I I knew this was losing, so it's like okay, I just keep the bishop on the board, don't trade the bishops, and um, and it will be a draw. So I go back. Magnus finally plays f6 here. The only way to try and win here is to swing the king and get the bishop here. So theoretically, let me make a couple of silly moves. Um, king f5. Let's say I go back to f8 here. Now white can go bishop e3, and now it's a zugzwang, because if I move the bishop off, I lose the juicer. If I move the king, his king infiltrates again, and he gets to go f7. So the only thing to do is not to get zugzwanged, um, and the way you avoid doing that is, again, keep an active bishop here where the bishop can just run along and always attack this pawn on f6. So he goes here, I go here, king f5, I play bishop g5, uh, bishop e5, I go bishop h4, um, and I just keep the bishop glued to these two squares where it's always attacking the pawn, and um, have I memorized the entire endgame manual? No, but there are certain endgames that you do know by heart. Um, so bishop f4, I take, he takes, I just drop back, and again, we reach this endgame king and one pawn versus the king and um of course this is a draw because when white goes king h6 there's no extra side of the board to go to no extra side back off the board there are only eight by eight rows there's there's eight to h and one to eight there's no king to um there's no king to h9 or king to i8 there are no extra there's no extra space you run out of we're at, we're at the edge of the board um so this second game ended in a draw um and let's keep going let's go to the third game which I did win. So third game, I had the white pieces. And this game, again, same opening, Berlin defense. And what I decided to do here was very similar to the previous one. What I decided was I was basically going to fling, fling poo at his king. Um, now, I know you guys aren't going to like me using the, the, those words, but the idea here was um, basically just, just fling the pawns, like, you know, fling the poo, fling the pawns up the board, and try to put the knight on f5 um, and pray that it would work. Um, so... So, um, so yeah, so <laughs> I said a bad word, yeah. <laughs> so basically I decided to play knight c4, a5, and I just went g4 here. Um, unlike the previous game where I played bishop e3, I just figured just, just fling it, fling, just fling the pawns up the board and try to put a knight on f5. So in terms of playing this, this opening, the, the idea was very much inspired by the one and only, the legend himself, Fabiano Caruana. Um, and, and also Jan Nepomniachtchi, both of those guys have very frequently just started flinging their pawns on the king's side and trying to put a knight on f5 and just attack. Now, the other thing that I would say about this game that's important to note is that um, at this point in the match, I felt this was it. If I did not win this game, um, I would not have chances to win with black. So I very strongly felt like this was it. I had to go for it. And, um, and I had to win this game. And, you know, if I, if I played something like this, which objectively is slightly dubious, don't get me wrong, um, who cares? Because I did not think my... I thought my chances of getting an all-in attack in this game and winning were far higher than my chances of Magnus blundering and losing a game with the black pieces. And also I would add that, like, in a classical game, probably this is much easier for black to play than it would be in a rapid, uh, in a rapid game. So here he goes, rookie eight. 
So I play rook g1. Again, just fling it. Just put the rook here. Just fling it. Ignore your development. Just just, just fling the pawns and try to put a knight on f5, basically. So he goes um, a4. I go knight e3. And here Magnus took on e3, which is actually, I think, a very bad move, objectively. Um, computer, I think, doesn't like it. But Magnus, as a human, certainly was very worried that if I get a knight to f5, the knight on f5 is going to be really, really strong here. And so the idea is just put the knight here, fling the pawns. Um, so he takes, I take back, he goes knight f8, um, I play h4 again. I think here the computer likes queen d2, or maybe even a3. Queen d2, queen c3 is supposed to be good, but I'd say, you know what, just fling it. Who cares? Even if it's probably not right, just fling it up the board. So I play h4 here, and just, just fling it, h5, g5, he goes uh, queen d6. I go queen to d2, play c5, and now I play h5 again. Just, just fling it, try to stick the knight on f5 like I want to do with my other knight. Um, so he plays b5. I go knight h4 here. Again, trying to get the knight to f5. As Gary Kasparov, the former world champion, said many times, a knight on f5 or a knight on f4 is almost always worth at least one pawn. So he goes queen c6. I play knight f5 here. Um, and again, I get the knight to f5. If black ever takes a knight, for example, I take with the pawn. And now the king is in really bad shape. His knight is also in bad shape. It's really dominated by my pawns on f5 and h5. Um, so he goes c4, and now here I play queen to b4. Uh, the idea is to try and fork the king and the queen here with knight e7 with the queen supporting. Secondarily, um, I also maybe want to go h6 and put the knight on g7 and attack the rook on e8. So this is very, very dangerous. And amazingly, the computer actually gives white a big advantage here. So here he plays a uh, pawn to a3. I go b3, of course. I don't want to take this pawn. If I take the pawn, he might even have something like rook a4. There are a lot of threats here, um, and it's not the right idea. So I go b3 here again, prevent rook a4. Uh, and when he takes the pawns, basically everything is very solid. I'm controlling all these squares. I can maybe even play a delayed bond cloud with king e2 at some point. Um, and it's very, very good here. So he goes queen c2, and is the engine wrong or am I wrong? No, no, the engine's the engine's insane. So here I play um, uh, h6. He goes pawn to g6, and now now in this position I played rook c1, which maybe is the wrong move. Um, it's a very tricky position. Um, one of the moves that I considered here originally was to play knight to e7 check, but I thought after knight to e7, black would take take and go queen c3, king e2, and he's this very nasty move. Bishop takes g4. And what you'll notice is that at this point, um, if I capture the bishop, he eats the rook on a1. And even if I get queen f6, after knight e6, even though I'm trying to create the lobster pincer, his lone knight covers the square, and black is completely winning at this point in the game. So I played rook c1, he took, and now I went rook d1. Um, apparently knight e7 is winning here. Um, but the problem was after king h8, I originally wanted to go bishop g5. And I thought that after knight d7, I was winning with rook d1, because when the queen moves, I don't know, here, I just take the knight, he takes, and I checkmate as king with bishop f6 and the knight covering the squares. Um, but the problem is, is that, it, like, I was slightly rattled because I suddenly realized he can go rook a6 here, and he cuts the square. Now, apparently, this is still winning for white after rook to g3, but I, I wasn't 100% sure what was going on at this point in the game. So I thought, um, yeah, I, I know rook g3 is winning. Sessa, I think, said it's winning. Um, but it's very hard if you're not 100% sure what's going on to play like this, which is why I played the move rook to d1, because I thought it was more logical. Queen c2, I went knight g7, uh, trapping the rook on e8. He has no real squares to go to anymore. He, he can't move his rook without losing it. And, um, and now he went bishop b7. Apparently, after bishop takes g4, the game is very, very unclear here still, because after rook g4, he plays rook d8, and, um, and it's not clear. No, apparently it is winning. Wait, what? No, after rook d8, I go rook d2. I was, uh, my second actually in between the games told me that after rook, d, rook d8, it was still complicated. But apparently this is just winning for white. So maybe not. So maybe maybe it's just it's, it's just really bad here. Um, at any rate, he goes bishop b7. I trade. And now I play f3. Very nice move here, by the way, because now I create this, uh, this pawn clump or whatever supports the pawns. And, um, and the king is just too open here. So now Magnus takes, which is the only way, because if black doesn't try to take the pieces, or take a pawn and create counterplay, he's just lost on the spot. So I played rook d2. He checks. I go king up 2 
Pawn to a2, trying to make another queen here. So I go queen c3. Stopping the pawn from queening, I cover it twice. Now, now if black plays a move like b4, I can just go very quietly, go queen b2 here. Black has to trade the queens. And after rook a8, just rook a1. And, um, and I just take the pawn in a2. And, uh, and it's just game over. White is completely winning. So because of that, he plays rook a8 here. And now I correctly saw that I could just take takes and go queen takes e5 and now the position is just winning by force if black goes queen to a1 i go bishop d4 i cut the diagonal and i make the checkmate or i win his queen next move and after uh knight e6 here um i just go bishop d4 and it's just checkmate by force on h8 if he takes a bishop i make checkmate here with the pawn and the queen um if he goes king to if he goes f6 i just take the knight king f8 and i go checkmate if king h8, checkmate. And um, if he goes king f8, here the only other try, I play queen h8, king e7, and now I go bishop f6, which is just checkmate. Rook covers all the squares on this line, and the queen guards the bishop and covers all of these squares as well, and um, and that, that would be winning. So uh, because of that, after queen e5, I think Magnus resigned here, which even up the match, one and a half, one and a half, going into the fourth and final game. All right, so I guess, what is this? Is there another clip to watch? There's apparently some, some clips, so let me pull this up. What is this clip? What is this? Um, hello? Hello? Had to leave in the blitz and I only had to make a draw as white and I mean I almost lost all of these three matches uh, which just says something about uh, his resiliency and how 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 good he plays even with his, his back against the wall yeah absolutely I mean there was this moment in this Armageddon that you you picked white was there some uh, emotions were playing at all because you were just before Okay, I mean, all right. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, like I've, like I've said before, you guys, um, and I'll, I'll say it again. Um, let me go back here. Um, there, there, there definitely is, uh, I, I have a lot of respect for Magnus and for his chats. Let, let's, be, let's be very clear. When you guys t start trying to stir up a, t a ton of drama, you know, about, about this or that, what I would say is, um, in this match, I, I certainly felt that at critical moments, Magnus made some mistakes, but overall he played very, very well. Um, and I, I think, you know, there were, there were a couple, there were a couple situations um, that, that I thought, like, for example, the, the fact that I beat him in that black game in the blitz, the, the second blitz game, for example, was like, that's a one in a million chance. Like Magnus never loses with black. And so there were some critical moments, like, even though you can say like today came down to an RB again, it's one twist this or that way. He did play very, very well. And, and again, you guys, when you try to act like, you know, there's some huge drama, there is no drama. Um, all I want is chess community drama. There is no drama. Um, uh, definitely not. So, um, okay, dude, goodbye. I mean, if it, you, you, you wrote something ridiculous earlier and now you can get banned. Have fun. Find somewhere else to watch chess. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. All right. Uh, as I, as I was saying again, um, certainly, you know, I, I felt that the other thing I would say in terms of this match, um, disregarding that it came down to one game at the end is there's probably no one else who I played who, um, where, where I felt that, uh, they would have been in this match in the same way where they would not have lost the match before this, before this, uh, before getting to this end. Like there, there were many people who I think if they had the positions Magnus had, on the first like three to four days probably would have just gotten swept away so um magnus was also very resilient he found a lot of very very good moves um in critical moments especially um especially like the uh the second day i felt that was a big turning point um because the match totally could have gotten away from him if he did not win that english game um in that third that was the third game i think of the second match um so so yeah that's uh he, he played very very well yeah, I thought you were going to win until the Armageddon. Yeah, my best chance was probably in the second Blitz game, um, which I will look at. I haven't actually looked at any of the Blitz games. But but also what I would say is Magnus completely lost his mind in the first Blitz game. So, you know, I think I think overall, really, it was a very, very balanced match. It, it came down to one game. I think if I had the choice and I could have picked Black, I think I probably would have won. Magnus had the choice. He picked Black. So I think that's why he won. 
Um, it's just one of those things. Any any idea why Fabiano was not in any of these tournaments? You know, I was going to say um, there were two people in particular who did not play in most of these events. Um, and I thought Fabiano and Vichy were both not playing in many of these events. And I, to me, that was very, very strange because Fabiano is, an, is a big competitor. He likes to play a lot of chess. And, um, and I was very surprised. So also, before we get to the before we keep going. Well, actually, first I need to plug in my mouse because my mouse is actually dying. So give me one second. Um, before we before we go on with the analysis, what I, what I am going to say is I'm also going to just do my do some general general talks talk about this tour and about who the players that I feel deserve recognition of players that don't just players that kind of um, I let's just say I'm going to be have some negative comments to say. So okay, let's start. So first of all, obviously I felt that I played very well and I thought Magnus played excellently. We were by far and away the two players who played the best chess throughout the whole cycle of events. Okay. Now, what I'm going to say is that another guy who des des deserves an insane amount of credit, like literally insane amount of credit, is um, is Ding Loren. The guy is, is incredible. I'll, I'll talk about Danil and other people, but Ding Loren, that guy, if you, if you would have told me two years ago that Ding Loren would be competitive in Blitz against like myself and against Mag, or not Blitz, sorry, in Rapid Chess against against myself and Magnus, I would have I would have probably laughed you out, laughed, I would have laughed you out of the room. Um, if you had said that two years ago, because Ding Loren was certainly a player who in the past had big struggles and big issues with rapid chess and blitz chess. Um, and, and I think that it's very clear based on his results that was true. Uh, having said that, Ding has worked really, really hard and played extremely well. I mean, I lost him in the semis or quarters, whatever it was, of, uh, of, um, of uh, the Chessable Masters. He also took a set off of Magnus as well. In the um, in the semifinals of the Grand Grand Tour overall, um, so Ding certainly deserves a lot of credit because he's improved a lot at rapid chess. Now I will give you a comparison of that. I'll give you another another guy who two years ago I thought needed to really improve the rapid and blitz chess, and his name is Fabiano Caruana. So if you look at the two players, Fabiano played in two of the events, but he did not have really great results. He still continues to struggle quite a bit in rapid and blitz chess. Um, Whereas Ding, who I thought was objectively probably worse than Fabiano at Rapid and Blitz a couple of years ago, has just gone total beast mode, and he's just like, he's bossing it out all the time. So what I would say is that Ding has really worked hard on his Rapid and his Blitz, and has really improved hard, whereas Fabiano has tried, but somehow it's just not clicking in the same way, whereas for Ding, he's just, um, he's just, he's just killing it. So... Um, I think certainly I would give um, I would give I would give big big props to Ding Loren especially because he really he really has 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 worked hard on his game and he's um, he's improved a lot. Um, I would say also Danil Dubov as well played played some great chess throughout. Uh, he beat me in the finals of the Lindoris Abbey tournament. Um, I mean I kind of got my revenge in the semifinal, but nonetheless he played very inspired chess throughout. So I would say probably the four players who made it to the finals deserve the uh, deserve the biggest props certainly. Um, Beyond that, um, I would say probably special special recognition for um, who 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 had the who had that critical win. Um, I don't know. I don't I don't know. Maybe Anish Anish certainly played well. Um, Peter Savidler also had a great performance. I thought in the final event he was he was on fire as well. So he does. I thought Jan for whatever reason he struggled throughout. Um, other than the final event, he struggled a lot. Um, and Maxime as well just didn't. I don't know. He just didn't seem to be there um, in the events that he played. So I would say they probably they probably struggled the most. Uh, I will not say much about Ali Reza in general because Ali Reza he's very young. He he's very new to th this level of competition. So trying to like say like he should have performed better based on his blitz like online, I don't think that's really fair because of how because of how new he is to th this sort of level and playing against players of this caliber. So when you talk about Ali Reza, even though he struggled, I don't think I don't think you can really say that it was like he should have done better because he just doesn't have the experience yet. Um, so those are probably the people that I would, I would say certainly um, deserve the awards. Of course, Ali Reza is, Ali Reza is obviously going to be, be very good going forward. And I think Ali Reza is playing a tournament maybe in Norway, if I'm not mistaken, down the road in October. So um, it'll be very interesting to see how he performs there as well. All right, you guys, so let's keep going. Let's move to the fourth game of our match today that Magnus and I played. Um, so I played with the Black Beast. So c4 e5 g3 knight f6 bishop g2 d5 trade knight c3 knight b6 knight f3 knight c6 
Uh, castle, bishop b7. No clips, you guys. No clips right now. So d3. I castle, bishop b3, bishop b6, rook c1, knight d5. Um, as you guys probably remember, we had a game in the first game of um, the... Ma I think this was actually in the first event that Magnus and I played the finals. Um, what was was that called? The Magnus Carlsen Invitational? I don't remember. The first first tournament that, 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 um, that occurred on Chess 24, we had this position, the very first game of the final. Um, uh, I was going to roast people. No, I... I didn't roast anybody. I mean, I, I thought, like, Vichy struggled, but he only played one event. Like, I mean, he just struggled. He just, he just struggled, but he only played one event, so I don't know what to say. Anyway, e, a3, queen d7. Pretty standard opening here. Again, black tries to take the center of the board here. White tries to attack on the queen side as well. So he goes queen c4. I play a5, rook c2, f5, rook c1. Now we trade, and now I go rook d5 here. Um... Basically, at this point, position is pretty balanced. White is maybe very slightly better due to the long-term pressure uh, with the double rooks on the C file here. So he plays rook C2. I go bishop D6. Um, he goes king G2, which, by the way, I think is a big mistake here. I think Magnus just missed F4. Um, now, it's not to say that, that what, black is much better here, but um, Vichy said he was tired of playing on Zoom calls. Ah. Aha, okay. Uh, yeah, I can see that. If you're not used to playing online and then having to deal with, like, the, the Zoom calls. Um, when they interviewed Vichy during the Legends, he pretty much called online chess not real chess. Does somebody have a clip of that? Is there an actual clip of that? Does somebody have an actual clip of that? If there's a clip of that, I want to see that clip. Um, anyway, so Magnus blundered up four here. Because now after bishop c5, he can play pawn to b5, hitting the rook. And that's not to say black is much better here, but after rook c3, knight d4, attacking the rook, he has to trade. And after trade and rook e2, black is up a pawn. Now, mind you, with this active knight and the outpost on e4, white is probably equal, equal here, but objectively, there should be very minimal chance of trying to win. So Magnus goes king f3, I play rook e6, he goes knight e4, play a4, consolidate my pawns on the queen side, goes rook a6. The idea is to play rook takes c7. If I take, he'll take the rook on e6. So now I play rook, rook e8. He goes rook a7. White's idea again, trying to double stack on the seventh rank. I play h5. King g2, rook f8. Pretty standard here, pretty equal position. Um, probably to play h4 and rook f4. Next move, he goes uh, rook b7. I go king h7. Now white plays f4. And even though black is up a pawn, this knight is really, really good on this e4 square. It's this great outpost that can never be removed. Um, I was watching the sets analysis of this and couldn't believe you were both playing the top engine moves for like the first 25 moves of the game. Well, moves are pretty straightforward um, in all seriousness. Uh, so I play h4 here. Yeah, you guys, if you have a clip of Vichy, just go scroll scroll through the VODs and see if you can find that clip. I, I totally would love to see that Vichy clip if it exists. So I play h4. Knight d6, I take with the rook. Again, not worried about white taking with the double rooks on the seventh here, because if he takes with this rook, I go rook g6, and I put pressure on the pawn on g3 here with rook g6. Now black is actually winning here, because both of these pawns in f4 and g3 are going to collapse, and white will be losing here. So instead, Magnus decides to play rook takes b5, and it's worth noting here I cannot play rook g6, because if I go rook g6, there's rook to h5 check, hitting the king and collecting the pawn at h4, which will basically consolidate white's position. So I play pawn takes pawn, king g3, I go rook f6, trying to uh, double my rooks and attack the pawn. Again, long term white has a better pawn structure with these pawns being supported versus my pawns being, being completely split here. So he checks, I go here, rook h5. And now I play rook to e6. Again, another logical move, the idea to play rook e3 and win this pawn because the rook is supported here. And if I win the pawn on d3, it should always be a draw. So Magnus plays king g4. I go rook e3, sticking to the plan to attack the pawn. And one thing that I was very proud of throughout the uh, throughout this match as well was that I trusted my instinct and I played a lot of these moves right away. In, in the old days, probably I would not have played a move like rook e3 right away or rook e6 right away, whereas... Today, I was using like 5 to 10 seconds to play these moves. And um, whereas in the past, I've been like, oh no, like I'm so worried. I'm worried that Magnus is going to find, um, he's going to find some magic trick and the whole thing is going to collapse. So I was very, very, uh, very happy that I played Rookie 3. Why do you only analyze games you won? Uh, I'm pretty sure I did analysis on the first game that I lost, you guys. But thank you.
Anyway, I play rook e3, plays rook h3, we trade, and now I go rook to e8. Again, same idea, bring the rook to e2, hit the pawn on b2, or go rook e3 and take the pawn on d3. So he plays rook h5, and now I go rook e3, same idea, take the pawn, rook c5, we split, we end up with these split pawns. Um, and the important part of the split pawns here is that white can try to get two connected. White would really like to get b2 and a3 running up the board. So now I go rook d1, which I think was correct. He goes rook d7, I go rook d2. Again, the idea being that if I can ever win one of these pawns, even if I lose potentially both pawns, it's always a draw. Hikaru, why do you only analyze the games you play? Thank you, 220, 228, appreciate it. Um, so he goes rook b7 here, I go d3, king f3. And now I play rook h2, keeping the king cut laterally so the king can't make a beeline for d1 where it would be able to take the pawn. So he goes rook king e3, d2, rook d7. Of course, the king can't cross the row, so he has to try to take it from behind. So I queen, he takes, or no, sorry, I made a knight to be funny. I make a knight, he takes, I go rook b2. He goes king e4, rook b3. Again, putting pressure on the pawn, rook d3. And now it's just a matter of calculating the tempi here. It's like you go here, here. King b4, f5 takes, king f4, he moves the king. g5, a4, g4. A5, G3, A6, G2, A7, G1, A8, and the game will be a draw because we both queen at the same time. So just a simple matter of making the right calculation, and um, and now he goes King E4, King F6, F5, um, um, and now I play play G6. I said I made a conceptual blunder where I played B takes A as black. B takes A as black. Um. B takes A, I took a pawn on the A file that was a big conceptual blunder. Um, what game could that be? No, in the, bl the Blitz game, I... Oh, he's saying A takes B4 in the Blitz. Oh, second Blitz game. Well, yeah, but I blundered Knight C5. That was the problem, actually. I blundered Knight C5, so we'll, we'll get to that later. But anyway, um, we're still looking at this game. So takes, King G6. Um, and now at this point, it's uh, I just run the King to the corner, and we reach the same position again. Um, with the king on the edge of the board, and this is not different than the second game that we drew, where it was the king on king on a8 and the king on b6. Um, so we drew this fourth game, and now we'll move on to the blitz games. So let's move on to this first blitz game that I play with the white pieces. So I play e4, e5, knight f3, knight six, same thing. Uh, d3. And Magnus decides to vary. He doesn't play bishop c5. Now he plays pawn to d6. So castles a6. I take and go d4. We trade. Um, no, I, I know what you guys are talking about. Uh, c5, I play queen f4, he takes, castles, knight c6, um, queen d6, we trade, knight c3, position is pretty balanced here, uh, white is maybe very slightly better, uh, because black is double pawns, but it's not much of an advantage at any rate, so he plays bishop b7, uh, I play bishop e3, rook e8, now I want queen g5, idea kind of just, uh, hit the pawn on c5 twice, but I also guard against threats towards the pawn on g2 as well. So he goes queen e6, I play h3, a move that I was very proud of, by the way, because I could have played queen c5, but then he can play bishop takes g2, and after king g2, queen g4, king h1, queen f3, the game ends in a repetition here, um, with the repetition here. So, okay, so h3, goes queen c6, I play f3. Now Magnus blundered h6 here, uh, just forgetting that I could play queen takes c5. I think, I mean, I don't know if he just forgot that it was hanging, or he thought there was something hanging here. Or what he did but when he blundered this pawn um i knew now that it was going to be game on mind you it's still um uh it was still very very hard to win because again opposite color bishops here and there are a lot of pieces on the board so Ma now magnus goes bishop e6 i play bishop f4 goes c5 i go rook d1 again very important to try and keep these pawns here as flexible as possible on the queen side um because if i end up with some situation where the pawns all get on dark squares he'll be able to plant the bishop and it'll be a draw so a5, rook d2, a4, a3. Of course, get the pawn off the off the uh, light square onto a dark square. Um, but for example, let's just say I, let's just say I play um, rook a6. Let's just say I play a move like c3 here to illustrate. After bishop b3, let's just say rook c1, c4. This is very close to a draw because now the whole queen side is permanently locked down. Bishop guards the pawns, and now black can just try to trade the rooks, and I can never touch anything over on the queen side. So it's uh, very 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 dry. So that's why I go rook e1, he plays rook b6, bishop e5, idea to bring the bishop back, support the pawns, and not have to give him the square on b3 where he can support the pawn on a4. So bishop f5, bishop c3, we trade, f6, I play g4 here, um, he goes bishop g6, now I play rook d8, um, 
and rook b7, rook c8. Now Magnus tries to get active. One thing here is the king is very passive as well. So the, basically what white wants to do is try to run these pawns up the board. So he goes here, I go king d2, rook c8, goes here, I take b4. Again, it's a very double-edged sword sort of uh, sacrificing my whole king side. But long term, one thing we learn about endgames is that the only thing that matters here is whose pawn is going up the board quickest. And white's pawns here are much quicker than black's pawns. So he takes, I take, go a4. I don't really care about these pawns. Only idea here is to run the pawns up the board. Uh, why do I only analyze? Good one. Um, I play a5. Uh, you guys, I don't have beef with, with Charlie either. Um, speaking of Moist Critical Charlie, I actually was watching his channel last night a little bit. He was opening, um, I think he was opening packs of Yu-Gi-Oh cards, if I'm not mistaken. So not, no beef with Charlie. A big fan of what Charlie does. He's, he's, uh, he's amazing. So, Rook A2, I play A6. Who flings a pawn faster, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Who flings a pawn faster? You guys are full of... Okay, Rook A2, Bishop A5. Again, trying to push the pawn up the board. He goes Bishop E4, A7, B4. Black's only idea here is try to get these pawns rolling. Uh, now, he plays King G6, allowing Rook C8. And the idea here is just make a queen and take. Maybe B5, B6, B7. Black's pawns are very, very slow here. So, he plays F5. Uh, I go rook e8. Logical move, idea to take the bishop here and then make a queen um, because the bishop is the only piece covering it since my pawn and bishop shield the rook. So he goes bishop f3. I play take. He goes here. Of course, black cannot take the pawn, so then I check. King comes up and I go rook takes bishop and make a queen next move um, and hit the king on f3. The bots are deleting the Vichy clip. Oh, I, is there a Vichy clip? There is. Okay, what is this? Okay. I'll, okay, I'm not going to watch this right now, but I'll, I'll watch this after, you guys. I'll, I'll watch this after. I'll watch it after. No worries. Um, so G takes F5. Um, he goes King F7. And now I just make the Queen. Very clean idea he takes. And the point is that after G4 to try and make the Queen, I can check. King cannot come up to F6 if he goes here. Then I fossilize the King with Bishop D8, hitting the King. And I take the Rook. Um, and when he goes back, I just go Bishop B6. Uh, very importantly, I offer the trade of the rooks. I cover the square, but also very importantly, I cover this square so he cannot bring the rook behind. And now if he moves the rook anywhere, I just go check. King g8, pawn to f6, and it's just a very clean win here for, for, for white. So I won this game to take the lead in the blitz, so we'll go to this fateful second blitz game um, where I had draws, essentially. Um, so let's go through this one. So Magnus plays the English, pretty standard. Uh, plays e3 like he did the previous one, so we trade. Queen c2. Go knight b4, queen b1, f5 here, a3, knight d5, d3. And this is um, this is pretty uh, pr pretty normal position here. Kind of like a reverse Sicilian, basically. Both players develop. Um, we castle, he goes takes, b4, a6. Um, how do I feel? I felt fine. Not, nothing nothing specifically different. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I got a great position. Maybe a great Come on, where, why is my bar messed up? I got a pretty decent position. Uh, not really going to talk much about most of these moves. I really would like an act, actually, I'd like the engine to be accurate on this game specifically. So I played bishop g4, queen a2, king h8, 91, very good move by Magnus, by the way. Come on, let's not, like seriously. Um, so I go bishop d7, rook d1, queen f6, knight d3 here. And, um... So now I go queen h4. So queen h4 here. I did hit the pawn in e4. So Magnus plays f3. I go rook a8 here. And the point is that at some point I want knight d4 or bishop e6 here. Yeah, I'm, I'm annoyed because I, this is actually one of the games that I want to look at closely. And um, uh, yeah. So g3, queen e7. And I mean, at this point I was way up on the clock too. Like I was up like a minute... At this point, reload the page. Yeah, then I'm at... Okay, I'll, I'll reload it. I'll reload it, you guys. One second. Oh, was I too confident? No, but I blundered. I blundered one critical moment, which is what I'm going to show you guys. So just give me one second. Um, okay. Let me close this one. One second. Yeah, I'm just going to reload it. I mean, maybe that's the problem. Let's, let's reload it. Okay. So let's flip the board. Let's go to the sixth game right here. Okay, so we're somewhere around here. So g3, queen e7. Um, and now here the position is, I mean, it's it's pretty balanced. I think you guys see rook f2. 
Uh, the one issue with this position is that there, there are a lot of pieces on the board as well. And if I ever play knight d4, it's a very committal move because white's going to get some kind of pawn chain in the center of the board. So I play bishop e6, queen d2, bishop b3, rook c1, e8. Yeah, and this is where I blundered. Like right around here, I, this is where I thought I was doing really, really well, and I blundered with a5. Um, I wanted to play bishop c4. This was actually my original idea, and then for some reason I double clutched it. Because I thought he could play knight b2, and... If I take queen e2 and yeah, an a5 here, this is really that good after b5? Huh. No, it's not. Okay, this was my original idea, but I thought this was very tricky. Um, maybe this is actually good for black. I mean, knight a7 is a very hard move to play here. Um, but yeah, I, I double clutched here, which kind of, kind of cost me. Um, uh, but yeah, I missed... Knight a7, it's really that good. Wow. Huh. Huh. It's really that good. Okay, I mean, this is a little bit dank, but the problem is that I miss it, and then after a5, I, or not miss it, but then after a5, I completely miss knight c5. And so, when Magnus played knight c5, this completely threw me off, too, and I immediately took on b4, which was a huge mistake here. Um, I probably should have traded, but the problem is that at this point, even if I get this position with a4 and black is maybe better, not better, sorry, black is okay, it's still going the wrong direction because white has the bishop here. So, I mean, I can probably still, if I play this correctly, hold the position, but it's already going the wrong way because it's a position where white has the two bishops, and now the, the whole game shifts where black has to find good moves and white doesn't have to. Um, so, like, yeah, I mean, I don't, like... I know that this is probably a draw with correct play, but it's very, um, it's still going to be very hard because white's moves are easy here. So, I mean, I should have done this, but I still, I still think that the, the, really the last critical moment in this game was not playing bishop c4. Because uh, this was my original idea, and then I didn't do it. That was really the, uh, the last critical moment. So I, I completely missed knight c5, and then I'm just like, and then I lost my mind for a bit. Because I'm like, what, just, what did I just do? Somehow, like, the whole thing is going the wrong way. And, yes, I should have traded, and I should have traded here. But even if I trade in this position and go a4, again, white is definitely better here. And, um, and it's going the wrong way for sure. Like, I mean, if you look at the computer, it's saying g5, which is an insane move for a human. Um... So, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, a before was a big mistake, 100%. But I still think white is better. And in a blitz game where white has the two bishops, it's gonna be a, it's still going to be a big task making a draw here. Um, so, yeah, so that's why I took. And now, I mean, the problem is now I think white's just much better here after. Maybe not much better. But, it, but again, it's going to be very hard for black to, uh, to do anything. So I play knight d4, king g2, which I thought was a big mistake, by the way. I thought... Um, I thought he was maybe supposed to take on d. Yeah, I thought he was supposed to take on d4, and he was better. But maybe king g2 is better. Hmm. Because I thought bishop d4 for sure was the best move. When we went king e2, I felt like there had to be a way to draw this. Although maybe I'm just supposed to go bishop a4, but that already looks kind of weird anyway. So I take. He takes. I take. Oh, and bishop d1. Oh, yeah, bishop d1, of course, yes. Why did I not do this? Yeah, actually, you know what? I saw bishop d1, too. But for some reason on bishop d1, I thought he could take and take c7, and the game goes on. Oh, but I just go rook c8. Oh, yeah, this was the this was the mistake. I saw bishop d1, too. Why did I not play bishop d1? I saw, yeah, I saw bishop d1. And then I thought he could take in the game. I thought he just goes, I thought somehow he just puts the bishop and he pushes the pawns. But it's actually nothing. I mean, maybe. Although, rook a2, h6, bishop b6. Okay, you know what? Actually, no, no, you know what? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm right here. This is probably a draw. This is probably a draw with correct play. This is, no, no, but you know what, you guys? know I'm actually right. Because with correct play, this is probably a draw. But this is very hard to play for black. Because I don't get to double the rooks. And white has four pawns in the center. So, no, actually, no, looking back on this, I don't, this actually was not a big mistake. Now that I look at this more in depth, because even though with correct play this is a draw, white is getting four. White has the connect four, and this is not easy at all. Um, why does he have to take the bishop? Because if he doesn't take the bishop, um, if he doesn't take the bishop, then it's just a very easy draw. I play bishop f3, and there's nothing white can do. Um, no, no, actually, you know what? No, when I look at this more now with bishop c7, yeah, no, when I look at this more in depth, I don't actually mind my decision here because he's getting the connect four. And this is probably a draw with correct play, but it's not going to be trivial either. Um, 
So, I mean, I should have played it objectively, because I think after takes rook b2, this was the last moment where maybe I had something. No, I didn't have something. It's already gone. It's already kind of, I mean, maybe it's, it's still maybe a draw with rook e3 and rook d3, but it's very, very hard to play um, at this point. But I still should have done something better, because I just forgot that when he takes and takes, it's a check on g7. I completely forgot that when he takes, it's just check. Um... So I should have played like h6 or rook e3, and I mean a computer would draw this easily, but a human would not draw this. Um, so, bishop a4, what happened? What, what just happened? Rook b7, I go rook f7, c6. Um, so I play h5, here he takes, now here I make the final blunder, I played king h7. Um, what I should have played was king to g8 here. There's no one at my door, you guys, stop, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it! Stop it! There's no knock on my door. Um, there's no knock on my door, you guys. There's no knock on my door. Um, so I was going to play King G8, and my, again, I made a slight failure. I played King H7. Uh, not that it makes a difference, but after King G8, White can play Rook C4, and he's winning. But the point was that if White goes Bishop D6 here, I go Bishop takes Pawn, and this actually is now a draw because... Um, because if he plays rook f7, I can in between or check him and then capture with the rook. And um, if he plays rook takes bishop, uh, not rook c5, he plays rook takes bishop, rook b7, king f8. Um, it's a three versus two, and the game goes on, but this should be a draw with um, with with correct play. Instead, I play king h7, and now this doesn't work. So after bishop d6, if I take the pawn, he just takes the bishop. And when I take the rook on b7, he just takes the rook. Now my king is on h7 and not g8 where I can recapture um, the bishop on f8. Um, so after I make a check, king g1, rook f6, c7, and now, I mean, it's just completely lost. I go bishop b7, he goes bishop f4, I bishop c8, rook b8, and I just resigned here um, because the rook is under attack and the bishop's under attack, and there's also a pass pawn that's going to go to c8 as well. So, I mean, in this game, the big mistake, I would say, was probably somewhere around the the biggest mistake was not going bishop c4. If I had played bishop c4 here, um, I mean, I think probably I would not have lost this game objectively. Um, but very hard. I mean, I know this one as well is probably okay with a4, but it, but it already feels... I, I'm not even sure when I look at this in depth that, um, that I would have drawn this because the two bishops, some f4, a lot of practical issues for white or for black in this position as well. Um, so, okay. All right, you guys, so let's move on to the Armageddon game, the last game that we played today where I had the white pieces. So I played e4. No, Nobody knocked on my door, you guys. Nobody knocked on my door. Okay, before we start this Armageddon game, I got, I got to watch this clip. Let's, let's watch this clip. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's 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 watch the clip, you guys. Let's let's watch this clip. Um, okay. Let's. Here we go. Okay. Let's watch the clip. Um, at this point, but I still should have done something better because I just forgot that when he takes and takes. Um, at this point, but I still should have done something better because I just forgot that when he takes and takes. <laughs> Um, at this point, but I still should. Have... <laughs> that's not. That's not on my door, though. That's that's not my door. That's not my door, though. That's not my door. <laughs> it does sound like a door, but that's not my door. Um, that's not my door. All right. Um, we also have another clip that I want to watch before we watch this final game. Um, let's watch this clip. What is this? Let's watch this. Okay. Right. Uh, that's uh, that's quite in that's quite nicely put. And just I know I don't want to keep you for too longer, but just uh, besides how the chess has gone, what's been the experience playing in this event and this online event uh, with players that you know you've had over the board long history with? Just your experience. Are you enjoying it despite the score, or is the score overshadowing that? No, I mean it's not even well. Of course, the the score overshadows everything. So, but 
we're not in the same room. I mean, I'm getting yeah. fed up with the yeah. Zoom world, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I mean, no, this. Uh, I really hope <laughs> we can see each other's faces again because uh, uh, it feels surreal. I'm sitting here alone, and uh, I'm sitting home. My my son wanders in once in a while, and uh, yeah. it's it just doesn't feel real. <laughs> On top of that, uh, for me personally, seven thirty is a very unpleasant time because normally we don't have a game that starts that late. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more about missing the um, environment. Okay. Um, stop laughing. Stop. La I mean, well, what is real in 2020? I don't even know. Uh, what is real? He wants to get central with his opponents over the board. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> definitely different. Um, so. So yeah. All right, you guys, so let's get back to the analysis. Let's take a look at this final game um, from today, the Ar Ar Arm Armageddon game. So I play E4. Uh, E5. Pog champs is definitely real, you guys, definitely. Knight F3, Knight C6. Play Bishop B5, Knight F6, D3, Bishop C5. I trade, I go Knight BD2. And here Magnus plays Bishop E6, which he has avoided playing the whole um, the whole event. This is actually a line that I usually play with black as well. And... Um, and what I want to do here is kind of, I didn't care. Again, I wanted to just fling it. Um, unfortunately, when I try to fling it here, Magnus anticipated it, and he goes the other way with the king here. So it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really do much. So I play knight f1, f6, g4, queen e7, of course, knight g3, castles. As you see, I get my setup here, but his king is way over on this side of the board instead of over on this side of the board. So I go, um, I go queen e2, king b8, a3. He goes here, bishop b3, pretty standard. Develop, try to castle the king to the queen side as well. He goes knight f8, I castle, knight g6, knight h5, um, bishop e3. I play queen takes e3. And I was very happy with this position, by the way, because here, even though black is completely fine, you just get to play chess. And that's all you can ask for in our, our, our Megadon game, where, um, where, you're, where you're white especially. So c5, knight d2, b6. Play knight b1. In retrospect, I was mad at myself. I felt that I should have played f4 here and just opened it up. Um, so I played knight b1. Knight h4 was an excellent move by Magnus, actually. Even if the computer doesn't say it was, I really liked it conceptually because he sort of closes down the whole king side, which is what he wants. So knight h4, I play rook g1, g5, knight c3, knight g6. Of course, Magnus tries to trade the knights here. Uh, I go king b1, we trade, queen e2. All pretty standard here. Open h file. However, if I can get g5, his pawn on e5 or the pawn on f6 might become very weak. So he plays rook h3, rook g1, b3. And here Magnus played c4, which I think in a normal game would make a lot of sense. But I think in this sort of situation, it was a big mistake. Because after we trade and I go g5, you'll notice that my king is very safe. But furthermore, I have a lot of access for my knight to rotate to a better square. Um, so we trade. He goes queen a5, queen d3. And around this point, by the way, I was starting to get very optimistic about my position because I felt that there's a weak pawn. If I can rotate the knight somehow, um, in fact, maybe my mistake here was not rotating with knight a4. Like I could have tried to rotate immediately or gone queen d1. Anyway, I played queen d3. Uh, chat, I'm sure there were mistakes in this game, but this was Armageddon game. Both players have no increment, so this is not about the precision. King b7, rook g7, with the idea to play rook c7, maybe knight b5. So Magnus traded, played rook h7, played here. Again, the main thing that I want to do is I want to rotate the knight to hit the pawn, specifically these two pawns on e5 and f4, and so that's why I play knight a4. So if I try to do it the other way, like knight d1, there's always an a4 break, and I have issues. So I try to do it the fancy way, just prevent any placement here, and go 1, 2, 3, and take the pawn. So he goes queen d6. And now this was also a tough spot, too, because at this point in the game, I really wanted, like in a normal game, I would have traded the queens. But the problem is this was an Armageddon game, where it's must win. If I trade the queens and go rook g6, um, he can just play like bishop d7. And, and even though I end up up a pawn, the game's going to be a draw. I mean, objectively. I mean, theoretically, maybe I could try to flag him here. But um, but you have to be more pragmatic. So I go queen c3. Plays bishop d7. Played knight b2, rook h3. And this is where I blundered. This is actually where... No, actually, it wasn't a blunder. Um, I played rook d1, queen e7. And I played knight d3, which is a big mistake. Because... Because Magnus was able to sack the queen here. Brilliant, brilliant idea that he found with rook f3. Um, whereas what I really needed was somehow I needed to get this knight to d3. And the way to do that um, would have been to play pawn to c5 first. Um, 
And after bishop b5, maybe some knight c4 here. I mean, maybe there's nothing in general. Maybe the whole concept is wrong. Maybe here what I should have done was gone rook f1. Yes, I think that... Ah, but there's bishop g4. Yeah, I think rook, this was the move that I should have played. Um, Because finding bishop g4 is very hard. If black doesn't find bishop g4 and I get knight d3 and I put pressure on the pawn e5, this um this would have been very good. Rook, rook takes f3, did not blunder knight c5. Um, I'll, I'll get into that. So after queen e7... Play this in Magnus correctly, took the pawn. Um, if I go knight c5 here after takes, queen f3, bishop c6, black is maybe very marginally worse. Not even worse, honestly, because he's got two connected. My pawns are terrible, and this is this is going to end in a draw as well. Um, yeah, no, I think the big mistake was here. I should have played, um, I should have played, it was right here. This was the one moment I had to play rook f1. If I had played rook f1, um, I'm not saying that Magnus would not have found the correct moves and held it, but this was the one chance I had um, to uh, to maybe take take advantage or do something. I mean, of course, Bishop G4 is a draw, but I don't, if Magnus had not found Bishop G4, then I would have won this game. Mind you, he probably would have, but we'll never know. And if he didn't find Bishop G4, I think there's probably like 90% chance that I would have won this game um, if he hadn't found it. So again, we'll never know what could have happened or wouldn't have happened, but that's, that's how it goes. Um, so I played rook d1, knight d3 takes, and now Magnus correctly saw rook takes rook takes d3 because after this, um, the position is objectively a draw. Well, I'm not going to discuss too much in depth. He takes, I take, and this is a critical moment that I will talk about. Not so much the later moves, the later moves don't matter, but this is the moment where um, where I could have tried to to essentially flag Magnus. I, I could have I could have played something like pawn to c5, traded these pawns, and just started dawdling for the next like 50 years. Um, and, and I could have tried to flag him with like c5 specifically. Um, and if I go c5, I think I think he has to go b5 here. And this this maybe is a draw. I don't know for sure. Um, but this was where I could have made a bunch of moves and sort of just sat around waiting forever. And um, and I didn't actually do it. I, I just decided I was just going to play play straightforward and try to just just progress the position rather than you know just make 20 million moves here. Um, and in large part, when, when I talk about this final game, not so much that there was an occurrence where I could have tried to flag him, but in general, um, is uh, I had actually decided, like I thought about this last night before I went to sleep, I was like, you know, if, if this match somehow goes to Armageddon and you end up in this spot, like what happens? I, I knew I was going to get white if there was an Armageddon game. I knew Magnus would never in a million years have picked black. Um, but I, I decided last night that even if there was like, even if it was like 10 seconds, I was not going to do, I was not going to try to flag it, I mean, you can say you should you should for all the money, um, but I, I did not. I d had decided I didn't want to do that because I felt the quality of the chess throughout was so high and so good that I was not going to do that. So I decided that in advance. Um, what be last night before before the game? I know people are gonna be like, "Oh, you're saying this now? Like you you didn't actually believe that?" But I I, I just it felt completely wrong to me. So I play queen here. King d2, rook e4. Again, I played b4 here. If I was really trying to flag again, I could have I could have waited longer. I could have um uh wait, why is it saying why is it saying plus one? No, it's it's crazy. Yeah, b4 is terrible. Um so I could have played b4, or b5, uh maybe c5. I mean there, there are many ways to play on it. This is obviously a draw, but I just I didn't I really didn't want to do that. Um it just didn't didn't feel right to me. So I just played b4, and now Magnus correctly goes b5, and at this point it's just um just a very easy draw. Uh, he just goes here, and at this point as well, you guys, just to add something, uh, just to be very clear, at this point there was no chance of flagging. Magnus had 50 seconds on the clock, and um, he can just repeat back and forth, rook b6, rook d6, and there's no way to to win here. So um, so at this point there was never an opportunity. The opportunity where I could have tried to run him, run, run him over on the clock was at the very start when we have the queen and three against the rook and three. Um, I would have, I mean, I don't know. I think I could have had a chance if I had just played like 20 moves in this position. I just moved all over the board. Um, but at the end, there was no chance of flagging. He had 50 seconds, and there was no chance. Um, I, I don't know, you know, you can say he would have done it. I don't know. To me, it didn't feel appropriate or proper, and I would not have done it regardless. I, I decided in advance I wouldn't do it. Um, so so we anyway, we get to this position, and now we just repeat some moves. As I said, there's no way I could have flagged him here, because he can just repeat rook b6, rook b6. He had way too much time on the clock as well, so I just offered a draw. Um, what's the point of rules then? Eh, that's just personal choice. But I, I had decided last night before I went to sleep, I had thought about it, if that was the case, um, that I would not do it. So anyway, game ends in a draw. So unfortunately, with this Armageddon game, uh, Magnus, Magnus wins with the draw, uh, because there were draw odds. So... 
you know, it comes down it comes down to what it is overall. Um, what I would say objectively is I definitely don't feel like I, I lost the uh, I don't feel like I lost the match at all. It just came down to one game with um, one game with uh, with with Black and Magnus had the decision and he picked Black. If I pick, if I had the decision I picked Black, I probably win the match. Um, for, win the match as well. I mean, the two games, the Armageddon games and Lindoris and the other one. Um, I would have, uh, I would have, um, or not would have, I actually, I, I won both the Blitz games. In the final, Lindoris, and this one, the two Armageddon's, I won Black. Magnus had a choice, picked Black, and he was able to hold the draw. So, um, it just came down to, unfortunately, a, you know, a decision in the final game. So, uh, that, that's what it is. I think it's only fair considering first Armageddon he chose White. Like I said, it, it, in an elimination game, Magnus would never have picked White. I think he picked white because he wanted to see if he could get something going in that match, um, more so than anything else. But if, if it was an elimination match, he would never pick white. I, I can tell you that. Um, I, and he, he might disagree with that, but I, in an elimination match, he would always pick black. Um, whereas in a match where it was an elimination, I mean, even I, I mean, I kind of wonder myself in, in a non-elimination match, I think I would still for odds pick, pick black, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. I think I, think I still would overall. But I'm not 100 percent sure. So, so yeah, that's that's what that's what happens. Um, and why did he get to choose? Because he was the number one seed because he had won several of the events. Uh, so I have no issue with that whatsoever. The rules are what they are. Um, what I would say, however, is that it feels like a very unsatisfactory final tiebreaker to have to have a match end that way. Um, but I don't know what the happy solution is. To say to say you know to to say uh, to say to say that you should like have endless blitz games yeah on one hand yes on the other hand the match has to end so like i don't really know what the happy solution is um for this event that's what it was um but i would say in terms of armageddon as a general concept i think it i think if you have players like myself or magnus where we have the choice and we can pick black it gives us a huge advantage over most other players um so so that that's what i would say in general terms um in regards to armageddon is i think the quicker the players are the better they are um you get a much be- you get a much bigger advantage end it with a classical game that is actually that is hilarious um i like that actually you know i like the idea of an armageddon where a player bids maybe like a player bids on the amount of time they want in the armageddon like white gets five minutes and whoever bids lower with black maybe gets the choice that's actually an interesting thought i think more than anything if you're going to make it an armageddon um I mean, I, I think maybe what it, that's actually interesting because, like, if you make an arm again, then both of us both of us bid low probably um, is my guess. That, that's probably what I would say. That 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 would be my guess. Um, if you're gonna do arm again as a general general concept, is what I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's what it is. Uh, again, like I said, chat don't don't. Once again, to be very clear, I did not have the opportunity to flag Magnus in this game because I played C3 and B4. Um, what I was saying is that I had the chance earlier to dawdle all over the board for 10 years and then try to flag him that way. Um, but at the end, there was no chance to flag. So let's be very clear on that. Like when I talk about it, it's not like the situation 100% occurred. Um, in terms of overall, though, I mean, yes, other than financially ending up with less money, I do not in any way feel like I lost this match. I mean, it came down to one game at the end who got the pick. That's life. But um, other than the fact that I didn't get the cash, like it, I feel like I won just as much as Magnus did. So um, I felt that I played well. Honestly, to be frank, I felt that going into the match, um, I, I was hoping I would win a couple of matches. I did not really honestly think that I would have a chance to win the match. And um, and I thought I played really well. And I'm very proud of the performance. Maybe not, not even so much as the performance overall, but the fact that when I had my back to the wall, um i really went for it like today for example i would have said in the past i would never have even had a chance of winning that third game i probably would have just lost the match very very smoothly um and so the fact that uh the fact that i was able to come back and play really really well and also the king's indian game the other day um was like that that more than the overall result is result is what i would say is really 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 special um so so yeah I know you guys are gonna say, "Oh, you lost," blah blah blah. Um, but I, I mean, I really don't feel like I lost, other than ha- other than the fact that I ended up with less money. Um, that's that's what I would say for sure. Uh, but it was a great match, great great tour of events. Um, big shout out, of course, to everybody who was involved with organizing it. Um, as we all know, there have been plenty of issues. Chess Twenty Four has, has made no, has they they they've done nothing uh, to pretend that they to to pretend that they don't 
have a great dislike for me but what i would say is putting that aside for a second um the events that have been held um that that they have run really filled a very big void that there was when the grand chess tour did not organize events this year because of COVID. so even though the, it's the end of the arc end of the season thankfully um i mean i've, I've had enough chess to last me for forever um like it's it's uh not forever i'll play more chess but for at least a couple of weeks um what i would say is that um is that it filled a void and it was very very good that there were these tournaments so um again they were the ones who put it on so they do deserve their their uh, their due um their their due ugh, their due credit that's not i was looking for some fancy word it's not coming to me right now um but yeah so so so, so that's what it is and um and we move on um, what I would say is I do believe Chess24 does intend for there to be another series of events. I do not know more beyond that, but I do think there is going to be another series of events coming up in the future. So that, that's all I'm going to say in general terms. Uh, but we, we just go on. And um, again, it was it was fantastic. And I had I had a great time. Um, I, I mean, I enjoyed these final matches. I didn't enjoy waking up at 5 a.m. every day, but uh, it was it was great. And. The other thing that I would say as well, again, is I feel like with these online events and how successful they have been, um, I do think we're moving forward where if there are more events online, chess is slowly moving towards the online world. It's more towards the esport world, and um, it's very, very, very good. So it's it's fantastic stuff. Um, all right, you guys. Uh, on that on that note, I think I am going to call it a day. I'm quite tired. It's been nearly a four hour stream um, after everything that's gone on. I didn't say juicer in the interviews. Yeah, sorry about that, you guys. Um, but I'm going to call it a day. Thank you so much to everybody for all the love and support over the last couple of months, the last couple of weeks. Everything you guys are amazing. Um, I will be back tomorrow morning for a regular stream. Thankfully, I can stay up tonight. I'm not in a rush to go to bed. Um, if this was yesterday, I would have been I would have been like one hour review and then I'd be asleep at 730. Luckily, I can finally relax, enjoy, maybe go catch the sunset over at, over at the pier in Santa Monica, perhaps. Um, so thank you again to everybody. It's been great. And um, I will see you guys uh, tomorrow, probably around like noon Eastern, maybe a little bit earlier.